Welcome to our webinar this afternoon. Um, we are here with our presenter, Alex Garnett, who's the Data Curation and Digital Preservation Librarian at Simon Fraser University. And at SFU Library, he works on initiatives relating to the new research data repository. And as a, at the Public Knowledge Project, he works on new tools for automatic typesetting and rendering of scholarly articles. And at the SFU Archives, he works on implementing digital preservation tools such as Archivematica and BitCurator. Um, so he's a busy, busy guy, but has taken some time out from that schedule to talk to us today about um, PKP's current XML parsing kit. And um, just a few notes about the format today. You'll note that you've uh, been muted as you come into the, the WebEx call. Um, uh, there will be time for questions at the, the end or throughout the presentation. Um, do you have a preference, Alex, if, if people have questions? Um, I'm not sure I can see people interrupting me effectively um, because I'm kind of new to WebEx, so I'm afraid I'll miss them if they interrupt during the presentation. So probably waiting to the end is best. I'll keep some time at the end for sure. Great. Okay. So, yeah, save your questions for the end. You can you can type them into the chat box as they come to you, and then we'll we'll relay them back to Alex after his presentation. Um, and you can also um, unmute yourself to ask a question if you like over the um, over the phone. Um, today's webinar is being recorded and will be available for later viewing on the LPC's YouTube channel as well. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Alex. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, first off, can everybody see my little Google Drive presentation right now? Can anybody not see it? Sarah, can you see it? I can see it. Okay, terrific. Can you see that I'm in the presenter view, or does that not come through? That does not come through. It just looks like a regular oh, presentation. Got it. All right, then I'll close the presenter view and just go back into this, and that should be okay. All right, look okay to everybody still? Yep, it's not coming through like full screen anymore. Is that? Oh, but that was working. Okay, sorry. I'll put the full screen back up. Yeah. All right. Yes, yes. Sorry for the uh, confusion. Folks. Yep, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, as mentioned, I'm Alex Garnett. Um, I work at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. I work for the library and the archives and for the Public Knowledge Project, uh, which is the developer of open journal systems you probably know about, also Open Monograph Press. And I work on a bit of a side project we've had going for the past several years, a new initiative of ours, um, trying to provide better solutions for parsing unstructured documents into structured ones. So I'm going to give you a bit of an intro here, which was originally given at the JATS conference at the National Library of Medicine uh, last year in Washington, D.C., because if you're really cool, you go to a whole conference for one XML format, and you have a great couple of days and just gonna give you a brief introduction to what we're doing here. So as I mentioned, uh, we're primarily based at Simon Fraser University. Our research lead, John Walensky, is at Stanford, um, but most of the work done at PKP actually happens here in Vancouver. Um, we provide journal hosting services and editorial training initiatives, uh, particularly for the Global South. And we mostly work on open journal systems. Um, if you've used OJS, you know the main draw of OJS, in effect, is kind of the review and the publication-focused elements. It's not really document-focused. And what that means <clears throat> in terms of XML is that most journals that are run on a small budget uh, don't really have the means to produce XML. It's kind of manual markup or bust in effect. And OJS doesn't help you get there. There's no kind of web editor interface in OJS. It just expects you to upload documents. And in many cases, what many journals wind up uploading is just PDF. And this is a bummer for a number of reasons. You know, printing to Word, uh, printing rather to PDF from Word doesn't really get you a nice modern document. It doesn't work that well on mobile. It's, <clears throat> it's hard to scrape and parse. So you wind up with something that, you know, it's just okay. And it's really kind of more print native than web native. And we've noticed this for a long time. There have been some past efforts to try to improve kind of producing structured XML. Um, there's a Word plugin from way back by Microsoft Research that tries to help you make more structured documents because the documents that come right out of Word are really difficult to convert to nice XML. Uh, PKP had a much older project called Lemon 8, which was released in 2009 or thereabouts, that took a similar approach trying to let you kind of have an editor that would try to gently push you into making XML, but 
because it wasn't Word and it was a little more difficult than Word. It wasn't really widely used. There's, of course, manual markup, be it an Oxygen or LaTeX or whatever else you might use to mark up an XML document. But a huge amount of that work is outsourced. And indeed, when I was talking at JetsCon, I found that was, in fact, the case, just because the amount of manual labor involved in doing that makes doing kind of in-house XML markup, uh, given the hours required, it's really implausible to do it in the developed world where most of these journals are published out of. So it's kind of this, this economy that rests on a little bit of a, you know uncomfortable proposition. Um, there are also unsupervised solutions for getting there, which is to say automatic conversions of structured XML. These haven't always worked perfectly because it's a really huge task to go from kind of a Word document with inconsistent structure and consistent formatting to a nice marked up kind of PubMed central quality or really any repository quality XML document. There's OxGarage out of Oxford which uh, accomplishes the task of doing a straight conversion from Word to XML, but it's just a straight conversion. So for example, if somebody hasn't used kind of the Word heading dropdown to properly mark up where they've got different sections, OxGarage won't add those for you. So all it does is convert one-to-one, -one, and because most Word authors just kind of play with their fonts, it doesn't really get you there. Um, you can also output Word uh, HTML directly from Word, but it's a bit of a mess. You ever looked at it before? It's the worst HTML you've ever seen in your life. It's like 1998 kind of came back with a vengeance and got you in the middle of the night and you're like, oh no, HTML. It's really bad. Um, there's also Word's uh, PDF output, uh, which like I said, is very popular. That drives a lot of the OJS ecosystem that can't afford XML markup. And there's a new open source tool called Pandoc, which is actually quite nice for just going uh, kind of input output between formats the same way I mentioned Docs Garage does. We'll get to that a bit later. Um, so we've got this crisis. You know, XML is not a fun thing to edit by hand. Uh, a lot of people in libraries kind of wind up taking on tasks like that, but it's really supposed to be machine readable format. And so anytime you wind up sitting up and trying to edit XML by hand, you really think kind of there has to be a better way to do this, right? Um, you know, people like to edit in Markdown, which is like the new alternative to, to Word, and you can edit in a plain text editor or a WYSIWYG and it's better structured. And I like Markdown a lot. You'll hear people who are really keen on new document formats really talking up Markdown, but it doesn't have anywhere near the distribution of Word, so it doesn't kind of get in the right part of the ecosystem for taking care of this, this unstructured document crisis. And so most journals that don't outsource don't publish structured articles, and that's kind of full stop the way things are right now. The economics of really, you know, kind of back converting Word are, are pretty bad. When you think about it, it's like you put a document into a blender and you want to take it back out again. It's like I want the fruit from the juice and it doesn't work unless you painstakingly recreate a banana by hand, which is a strange thing to imagine. And, you know, you really can't get a fully automated system up to now because of Word being Word. That markup in there is really tricky. But we're making, we're making a pretty serious effort, so here goes. Um, as I said, most of our journals are kind of in that unwilling or able to outsource, so we don't wind up getting anything other than PDF from them. And we are not in a position to advocate for a word replacement. People want to use Word, and there's no way we can stop them <laughs> as much as we might like to. But we can make a sane free solution, hopefully. So um, I'm going to give a demo of this site a little bit later. But we have this kind of new service, this uh, server that converts uh, Word or PDF input into structured XML, HTML, PDF, and EPUB. Right now it's running at pkpudev.lib.sfu.ca. And I'll show you more later, so don't worry about writing it down right now. Uh, this is our new platform. Uh, it's a fully open source. So what it is, it's a modular solution that basically queues up uh, a dozen different parsing libraries that all handle some aspect of this transformation process. Uh, so parse it is used for parsing citations. Uh, for our PDF conversion, we basically call a little HTML to PDF printer in the background. We use LibreOffice, which is the you know, open source uh, word editor. We actually use a version of that on the server to convert from older, more exotic formats like the old doc or RTF into docx, which is an XML format we can then work with. All kinds of stuff. Uh, we also uh, work on this core parsing engine uh, called MeTypeset which underlies kind of the most difficult part of the parsing process, kind of the heavy lifting going from Word to XML in the first place. We developed that with the Open Library of the Humanities, which is in the news a lot these days. They're doing a really nice job. Um, and they also helped us to work on this library. 
Um, here is a list of the modules used. I'll kind of give you a more in-depth view of this a little bit later, so don't worry about that right now. Um, here, we'll first start, we use uh, something called UNOCONV. So UNOCONV takes and wrappers LibreOffice in order to make it work from the background on the server, as I just said. Um, we then use OxGarage to convert kind of what we might have in docx format coming out of LibreOffice into, you'll see on the right hand side, National Library of Medicine NLM. But as I said, they don't really go out of the way just there to give you nice NLM. It's just kind of whatever they can give you. Uh, and here's where MeTypeset comes in. So it started out with OxGarage and what MeTypeset does is it adds all that tricky logic that tries to kind of say maybe your font size change and even though you didn't actually add the heading markup in Word, that looks like a title. Sure, we can call that a title. And so it makes a lot of different little inferences like this. Um, you could think of it as kind of a really naive form of machine learning if you wanted to. Uh, what it does, it looks at a Word document and says, if I wanted to turn this into a structured document, just from the way it looks, right? Because the word markup, you really can't take other than kind of how it appears on the screen to do much with it. But we take the word markup and we go through and we kind of do our best to derive some logic from it. The nice thing about this is because it starts with OxGarage, we don't really have to touch that, uh, that kind of Word open office XML stuff. That's gnarly. So we start with, uh, with the conversion from OxGarage, which actually invokes TEI. If there's any TEI fans in the audience say, woo, TEI. Uh, we, we kind of write some of this fussy parsing logic against the, the TEI XML on the way to getting the jets. And here's some exciting screenshots of source code. I'm not going to speak to this right now, but um, you'll see this is a function called nest headings. Like I just said, it kind of works its way through and tries to figure out, you know, based on your font sizes, indentation, et cetera, et cetera, maybe what did you mean to be a nested section? What did you mean to be a heading, right? So really a lot of work has gone into this and in trying to make Word documents a little bit more structured. And we can skip past this a little bit, although one thing to note is that it also does a nice job of handling Zotero, Mendeley, and EndNote citations. So if you wrote a document in Word and you're using a Zotero or Mendeley plugin to kind of help you structure your citations, we can extract that data. And that saves us a lot of time in citation parsing because if we have known good data, we skip all the messy parts. Um, we then use this Parseit library to do the reference parsing if we didn't have that known good data. Um, and again, this is just one more of a dozen open source libraries in our project. Um, this is like a Perl machine learning-y thing that's uh, actually developed by a university in Taiwan. So really just showing that we grab kind of all the best tools we could find out there for this process. Uh, we then, as I mentioned, use Pandoc, which does a nice job of actually kind of linking citations in the document to the back end. It uses kind of a markdown-y process, so that way we've got kind of inline reference match to reference list. Um, we do some stuff here. We add XMP metadata to the PDF. This is a cool thing that almost nobody notices. Um, when you download a PDF from a publisher website, like uh, Elsevier, uh, Science Direct, whatever else, the PDFs these days actually have embedded metadata, which, which can be kind of useful. Um, you know, you don't always notice it, but if you're reading it in preview on a Mac or something, it'll show you in the sidebar, you can actually look at like the author and the title and so forth. And this helps with Zotero and Mendeley organizing documents locally. We add that metadata. So it's just a nice kind of nice to have right, when we're making PDFs with our service. And I'm going to jump out of this presentation now and start showing off some more kind of easy to grok uh, demo -y stuff. So here, and I wonder if I can get that to be any bigger. Um, I'm going to hope this is mostly legible and if not, I can try to zoom in on it a little bit. Here we go. All right, so this is what that pipeline I was just talking about actually looks like. <clears throat> so we start out uh, with a, a submission in Word or PDF format, in effect. And as I mentioned, if we get it in one of the older Word formats, like Docker RTF, it goes through LibreOffice. So that way we get a docx, because docx is actually a native XML format, although it's a very messy one. And the docx, whether it was the native input or we got from LibreOffice, goes through me typeset. 
And out of that, we get the nice JAST National Library of Medicine XML. If we had a PDF submission, we use a different parsing library called Sermine, and that also gives us JATS output. So what we do here is we take the me types up in the Sermine outputs. If we had PDF, it goes through Sermine. If we had a uh, word input, it goes through me typeset, although we sometimes lean on Sermine for metadata because we like the front martyr parsing in Sermine a bit better. We merge them together. So at this point, this red box here, we've got a JATS XML document that's been parsed from the input. And that's pretty good in and of itself. You know, right, you're not going to actually find any other open source tools uh, that we're aware of right now that are widely available that will give you JATS XML kind of from uh, Word or PDF input. So already we've got a usable JATS XML document. It's probably not perfect, but if we scroll this along a little bit, there's a bit more functionality we add to that JATS XML. So, okay, we're in JATS format. We've got that nice XML. We have this whole reference parsing chain. So we run parse it to get the references into their structured parts. I can show you what that looks like in a second. We actually will spit out, if you follow this bottom line here, this is output of references only. We can spit out just the references in BibTeX format. So this is actually uh, an additional use of this kit of ours. You know, if you don't want to actually parse a bunch of full documents into XML, you could just throw 30 documents at it to extract their references which could be useful if you're building some kind of citation database. If you're digitizing a bunch of back content from one journal, for example, you can just throw all the documents at it, get the structured reference data. Maybe that's of interest for your research. Um, otherwise, we keep going. We use uh, tools called BibUtils and Pandoc, as I said, uh, to actually style the references in the document. So you can pick a citation style. Once you've got the structured references pulled out with, Pan with Parsit, Pandoc will then turn them into APA style or Chicago style or anything you like that way. So restyling references in a document, um, also pretty neat. And from there, we basically transform the XML into any of several different output formats. So we've got our own XSL transformation we wrote to get HTML. We also can convert that HTML to PDF. And we've got a different library uh, called JATS to EPUB that, surprise, gives us EPUB. So at that point, we've got kind of all the major reading formats covered, as well as having the nice gold standard structured XML that comes out. So that's effectively what the stack looks like. And I'm just going to tap over here briefly. I don't want to show everyone too much source code. I know nobody likes that, uh, especially not me. But here is where our code lives. It's uh, github.com slash PKP for Public Knowledge Project. If I jump out here, you'll see here's the different PKP repositories, so open journal systems and so on and so forth. By the way, just a brief plug, uh, open journal systems three should be out sometime uh, this summer, so look forward to that. <laughs> I promised I would uh, vouch for OJS3. And here we have the XML parsing service. So scroll down, um, we've got that list of all the different modules we're using. Um, if anybody's curious, this is all open source and will stay that way. Um, installation directions. And the reason I'm actually making everyone look at GitHub is because we have a nice API too. So right now, if you want to use this service, we have uh, OJS plugin. We've got a web front end. I'm going to show you those in a second. We've also got a command line API in effect. So for anybody wanting to do any kind of batch conversion or bulk uploads, uh, we support that and it's all documented right here. Uh, so you could, if you wanted to basically replicate this, you could run your own version of the server and then you could send batch uploads to our API and just replace the URL with the version of the server you're running. Uh, in the meantime, uh, the version that we're hosting is not at all rate limited. So you can basically hit it with as many documents as you want. Right now, we're just collecting data on how well it works. But if you do have kind of privacy concerns, not wanting to send your documents elsewhere, obviously we're not making them public, but feel free to host your own version. So if I go over here, you'll see what that code actually looks like running on a server. So here we've just got, you can sign up for a user ID. You'll get a confirmation email real quick. Here's some brief descriptions that include contact me if you've got any questions. And I'm just going to log in real quick here. And of course, I mis mistyped it. I'm actually doing this on a borrowed MacBook because my machine didn't want to work. 
here we go. So I'm the uh, administrator user, so I can just take a look at, at kind of other jobs that have been uploaded recently. Um, but I don't want to do that right now. I just want to go back to the main front page. And I'll grab a sample document here. Um, just this uh, EEG Comic Sans article I like because it's an EEG article written in Comic Sans. Um, I think I'm sharing Chrome now, but let me see if I can figure out a way to share a Word window so you can see what that looks like because that'll be helpful just for proof of concept. Hang on one sec. Okay. So there's that. And I'm just going to switch to sharing a Word window. There we go. I'm going to assume that worked. So here I just opened up the document I'm uploading to our service in Word. You can see what it looks like. Whoops. It is indeed a, uh, an article about EEGs written in Comic Sans. I guess is the appropriate gravity for talking about brain measurements. So you can see here, this is not a particularly well formatted document. You know, they've just kind of tabbed in, done bold, italic, et cetera, where they want to. Um, we've got some section headings, but if you'll notice where it says default style up in the top corner here, no one's bothered to make these into kind of the heading style when they were writing this document, right? So that means that as far as the back end of the document's concerned, it's not structured and it wouldn't be easy to just say, give me a nice XML from here. It wouldn't work. It's also got some pictures in it. And if we scroll to the bottom, I think we'll see some references. So let's go, whoops, do do do. And got some references. So this looks like a pretty typical document somebody might write up in Word. I like using it for a demo because it's a pretty complete document, but it's not that well structured, right? This is the kind of thing you might format and say, okay, good enough, it's complete, but not a lot of good XML-iness to it. So let me go back to Chrome. There we go, I'm getting good at this. Okay. And I've already picked, I'm going to upload this document. If I want a citation style here, I can start typing something and then it automatically provides some suggestions for which citation style do you want to use. And that's pretty neat. And this is not picking the input form. I don't have to tell it kind of what citations am I looking for. I'm actually telling it after you've parsed this document, what do you want to turn them into? So that's, that's nice, I hope. Um, you can do, you know, Chicago style if you don't like APA. Uh, this, there's a, bunch of options in this list. We might actually look at simplifying it somewhat. Uh, right now it's actually pulled directly from the citation style language repository, which is an open source project that Zotero and Mendeley both contribute to. And you can see kind of any citation style you want. We'll just go with APA because it's good, it's reliable. Hit the upload document button and just wait for that to go through. And all right, I've now got my job in the queue here. So we can check back in a second once it's done. And it only takes about two minutes typically. But in the meantime, oops, Webex is jumping in. Here we go. I can show you the OJS plugin we have, which works very similarly. Um, but we've got big plans here. So I've got a very typical OJS instance set up. It's, uh, it looks like what you get out of the box OJS. And by the way, the reason I plugged OJS 3.0 earlier in this call is because it looks a lot more modern than this. OJS 2 is starting to look old, <laughs> we're aware of that, and uh, hopefully we'll have something new for you pretty soon there. But in the meantime, here's OJS. Got my XMO, uh, XML, excuse me, <clears throat> XML demo journal set up. I'm an uh, author, editor, and a manager, which helps if you're trying to publish your own content, because if you're on the editorial board, then you can give yourself a pass all the time, which I like. Also, it's nice for giving demos. And I can click through to journal management and just show off here plugins and generic plugins. This does not currently ship with OJS, but you'll see we've got this document markup plugin in here. And if I hit settings, it's actually hooked into our XML parsing service at uh, that same URL I just showed you. And we've picked a citation style for all the documents that this journal is going to publish. 
So this plugin allows you to basically hook a given OJS instance into this site. If you wanted to run your own version of it, you would just change the document markup server line, and then you could have your own server running in your own process. All right, so we'll go back here. If you want to install that plugin, by the way, uh, it doesn't currently ship with OJS because we're waiting on a newer version of it, but it's right here, GitHub BKP OJS markup. And you can just grab that and install it on any version of OJS 2.4 or greater and get the same functionality I'm about to show you. But we've already got it. Okay, I'm going to make a new submission real quick. So here's the typical OJS submission process. Some of you are probably very familiar with this. And every time I look at it, it makes me happy that OJS 3 is coming soon. And here's EEG Comic Sounds. And we've got it as a submission file. And we'll say it was written by me, even though that's a lie. It was written by somebody in Europe at some point. Um, just put in some junk metadata. This is the best part of giving live demos. You have to try to not make the metadata too much fun. And we've got a submission going through. Okay. And now as the editor, we've got uh, one unassigned submission from February 17th. That sounds about right. Test article. Uh, I'm just going to make myself the editor because I'm the only editor at this journal. So of course I'm going to take responsibility for this one and go over to the review tab and we'll pretend that we're going to accept it. And it warns me like, are you sure this is a good article? We have no idea. Okay. It's accepted. Great. So we go over to the editing tab and what I've just shown you is basically a much, much quicker version of the usual OJS application process. We skipped out the whole peer review step um, and the metadata validation and all of that. So we're jumping ahead as though we're ready to publish this document. We're going to pretend we're scheduling it for the current issue. And what I'm going to do is upload a layout version, which if this was kind of using OJS for the typical purpose, you would say, okay, this is the version we're ready to send off to the printers, send off to the typesetter, send off to the XML processing shop in India. Kind of here we're ready to get print ready copies made. And I'm going to upload it here. Okay, and so you'll see here's the layout version. And if we check back here in about two minutes, it'll have already gone to our XML server and given us HTML, XML, and PDF versions right here. But in the meantime, we can go back to the job we already uploaded directly in the front end of the website and refresh this. And here we go. Uh, you'll see here are the new documents that got sent along from OJS, but here's the one that's already done. And here we go. I just uploaded this at uh, 1.25 my time, I guess uh, 4.25 uh, Eastern time. And here's the original EEG comic sounds. And here we've got the XML, the BibTeX, the HTML, the EPUB, the PDF, the zip, and so on. So let's look at what our service outputs. All right, we'll start with the XML because that's always the most fun. And oops, hang on a second. Never a good sign when my wife's computer wants to install Xcode when I click on something. <laughs> it's okay. I can get forgiveness later. Let me just, uh, there we go. Open the plain text editor. And let me go back to sharing because nobody saw that. A uh, different application. Here we go. Xcode. Yeah, all right, so here is some XML. Um, possibly hard to read. I'm actually not sure what the, uh, the zoom looks like for XML, but that's okay. Um, but you'll see here, we've got kind of up top article title. Uh, did not get parsed out because it just says article title. We've got contributor name, that got parsed out, 
email address, that got parsed out. We've got the institution, the country, we've got the abstract. Uh, this is all kind of tagged by our system. We've got keywords all came out, volume, front page, last page, publication date. This is all front matter that was just extracted from a Word document. And here's the article itself. And you'll see, you know, it looks about like you'd expect article XML to look like. It might not be perfect, but we've got this nice kind of list item. We've got section titles up here. And if we scroll back to the very bottom, we've got references. And I know this is probably extraordinarily tough to read. And because I don't know how to zoom in Xcode, I can't necessarily help matters. But you'll see here that we've actually got kind of all the individual references marked up with all their component parts. So you'll see here surname, article title, source, publisher name, and so on and so forth. So, you know, this is not too shabby, right? It's a, it's a bear to look at in the back end because XML is not meant to be read by humans most of the time. But here we have a fully parsed article, which is not so bad. So we can close this and go back to actually looking at some nicer outputs like HTML and PDF. So goodbye, Xcode and go back to sharing something else here. Okay, back to sharing Chrome. The HTML we give you is a download by default because it's got uh, CSS and JavaScript baked in, but I can show you a different URL that I've just made on short notice to kind of look at our HTML output. So here's this. Um, and just take my word for it, kind of, this is the same HTML we just looked at. And here we've got the same article coming from that same XML uh, parsed out into HTML. We've got this kind of, you can jump between sections in the sidebar, which wouldn't be possible if we hadn't successfully parsed out section numbers and section titles. And this HTML isn't perfect. This is something we kind of made to show off as a demo. Uh, but because we've got that XML, anybody else could make a different layout uh, fairly easily. At this point, you're just talking about kind of basic web design. So once you've got that XML, you can pop out the pictures here and look at them in full resolution. Once you've got the XML, you know, that's, you've basically won. At that point, you can just make it look however you would like. This is our amateurish HTML, but anybody can make a nicer one, we hope. Uh, we've also got this PDF, which comes directly from the HTML. So basically the same HTML you just looked at, uh, here's a PDF of it. And again, we could make a different layout for the PDF that doesn't generate directly from the HTML, but this is something that you can envision a journal linking to in publishing, right? Um, and of course, getting PDFs from Word is already pretty easy, but uh, going through XML, you've got the opportunity to style it fresh, kind of match the journal's uh, header. Basically, anything you want to do is really easy to plug in at this point. Um, and then we've got EPUB. I'm not going to show off the EPUB. I don't know what kind of EPUB reader I have on here, but you'll see there's a XML, HTML, PDF. And one more thing, I mentioned this bib tech earlier. Um, let me just show that very briefly, because I mentioned citation parsing, and this is the kind of thing I'm not sure everyone will be aware of, but it's something that I get kind of fired up about. So, ooh, opening Xcode again. <laughs> Maybe not. Let me see what I have for a text reader. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Well, you know what, we're not going to look at BibTeX today, <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, I mentioned it because, as I said, if you wanted to just put uh, a document through to extract raw citations, when I was mentioning it this slide, um, that's something you can, you can do. And you'll get out just a list of kind of uh, title, publication, year, author name, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in a structured format. Um, that can get imported into any reference editor or that you can use for extracting citation data from at a later date. So BibTeX is kind of an old standard. Um, it looks a little like JSON, if you're more familiar with JSON now, but it's still widely used by uh, citation managers and reference editors and so forth. And if you do want to just get raw citation data, that's an option. So we go back to OJS uh, at our little layout editor page. If I hit refresh, oh, Shoot, 
I wonder why it didn't go through. Oh, we're still on processing here. So I guess it's <laughs> it's mid go. That happens sometimes. Let me just eyeball uh, back end. We'll come back to that a little bit later in the demo. Sometimes it goes slowly if we've had a lot of jobs submitted at once. Um, the last thing I want to show off here before I break for questions, uh, this is called Lens Writer. Um, so I've just shown off kind of the XML, the HTML, the PDF output. I've talked about you can use our API, you can use our OJS plugin, you can use our web front end, um, but those are never going to output totally, totally perfect uh, documents. We're working on them and they're going to get better and they keep getting better, but the expectation is that, you know, if we could do all this automatically perfectly, we would put a bunch of industries underwater immediately and it's a good thing that we know we can't do that. But um, that does leave kind of uh, a question mark in the air, like how are we going to expect people to use this if the output isn't perfect? And this is the answer. This is uh, a nice WYSIWYG editor that works in the browser that will allow you to edit a native JATS XML document and rearrange section headings in nice ways um, and basically allow you to write structured documents in a way that Word kind of it encourages you not to do um, and integrate it directly into the editorial process when a document is coming out of our XML parser. So this is officially in the realm of coming soon. It's developed by an organization called Substance.io whom we're working with. This has been, I think, shipped with uh, eLife, which is a biology journal on the web so far. And we are looking to have all this integrated um, with OJS, with our XML service in time for the release of OJS 3 sometime this spring. So very happy to talk about that. Um, OJS is finally not going to have just kind of an upload a document and leave me alone mechanism. You're actually going to have an OJS that lets you edit in the browser and not constantly have to have this kind of unspoken fallback on Microsoft Word, which is something that we've wanted to fix for a long time. And this really, for me, is kind of the missing piece toward making our XML parsing production ready, is when you've got that WYSIWYG editor, which has nice ways of kind of citing figures in line and inserting tables and inserting citations and so forth. Uh, this is kind of the missing piece for me. So look forward to all this being available very soon. Um, just going to figure out maybe why this guy didn't want to go through the whole way. That's okay. My lab demo doesn't always work. The, uh, the version on the, uh, the front end did. I don't know why this OJS is unhappy right now. But oh well. Um, I already showed off where to get that plugin and uh, hopefully how to make the live demo work better in the future. And I think that's most of my spiel. Just gonna hop back over here quickly, um, kind of cover some of the contributing elements. So, like I said, um, it's all open source. Um, it's not GPL licensed, so you know, feel free to go nuts and fork this. Um, we we're not kind of purists that way. Um, and even if we wanted to be, we couldn't be because we're wrapping so many different open source components. It's something you're able to work on. Um, you can add your own parsing module. Like if you think there's something we've missed, if we've you know got LibreOffice but we've forgotten to add a different kind of converter module, please do get in touch. You know we're really looking to build an existing work in developing this and do as little as possible kind of from the ground up because we know that's a difficult approach. And again, it's been an outstanding problem for so long. This is us kind of trying to jump in and just tie it all together for people. Um, we're working on an efficiency study, which will um, provide some metrics, basically, as to how much time is actually saved by using this. So kind of real numbers for people who are looking to shift, um, we think that's going to be of use. And also thanks to Mark Neve with the Open Library of the Humanities as well as Stanford University's Media X Incubator. Um, they were the ones who provided a lot of the early funding and expertise to get this project off the ground. I don't want to fail to thank them. Um, and otherwise, uh, thanks for, uh, for joining in to listen to this. I know it was uh, kind of technical to listen to me for 40 minutes, um, but uh, hopefully you're excited about what PKP is doing in the future. 
So I'm going to turn off this screen share right now and maybe I'm not sure if you can see me, but uh, if you can, I'm happy to handle any questions. Thanks very much, Alex. That was a, a, a really informative presentation. Um, are there questions from the group? And you can um, put those in either via the chat window and you can send them to everyone or you can send them to me and I'll relay them to Alex or you can um, unmute your microphone and ask a question over the, over the mic. I'm hearing crickets. <laughs> Sometimes it takes a moment to for people to to formulate their questions. Um, um, in the meantime, Alex, can you tell us a little bit about the team that's that's working on it? Are you the um, so I assume you're you're kind of coordinating the work on this. Can you tell us a little bit about the rest of your team? Yeah, for sure. Um, so the Public Knowledge Project in a given time is about 10 people, um, about two-thirds of them developers, um, because my main responsibility is as a librarian and an archivist, uh, I have about 25% of my time into PKP, which involves coordinating this project, uh, as you surmised, and doing a bit of the development. So I'm not the lead developer on this project and haven't been since the very early stages. Um, I handle a little bit of the coding and most of the management. Um, we've also got um, a Stanford student developer working on this, um, which is through the collaboration with our research lead, John Walensky, who has worked on a lot of an automated testing stack for us so we can better evaluate how well we're parsing. We've also got um, one other full-time developer uh, from PKP, uh, Kasim Mashudi, who works for us uh, at, in Montreal. Um, as well as my colleague uh, Juan Alperin, who's a professor here in the SFU Publishing School, who kind of provides uh, some nice uh, oversight and also a nice target for me to yell at and vice versa, because that's always very healthy. <laughs> yep. um, and I see there's a question that came through about um, how the XML is validated after it's generated. That's a good question. Um, so basically, we just have the regular uh, JATS DTDs at the top of the XML output, and we do an external XML lint validation to that same DTD to ensure that it validates against the DTD that gets embedded inside of it. I hope that answers your question. Um, I, and I had another, I have another question for you, Alex, and I'm, I'm less familiar probably than some of the others in the audience about um, the types of media that PKP or that, that OJS supports um, itself, but is there, um, uh, your document had images in it, are there other types of media that it can, um, that it can handle? Uh, potentially, yeah. Um, but I mean, right now, if we're talking about that, we're only really accepting Word or PDF input into our processing pipeline, it's unlikely that somebody, I think, would have found a way to embed a video right. uh, into Word or PDF right. document. Um, but it's certainly possible that our JavaScript kind of our HTML viewer that winds up into OJS could display video in line. So yeah. while it might not be handled by the set of documents that we would kind of handle on ingest in this part of the pipeline, uh, it's definitely possible for us to support kind of like an inline video viewer. Uh, we've actually had some people talking about wanting to have an inline uh, spreadsheet viewer as well. I know there's a lot of cool talk around kind of embedding data in an article and not just having a static image of a table. Um, that, again, it's the kind of thing that it's hard for us to get directly out of PDF and Word. Like, we're already working with the lowest common denominator input. We don't always have that kind of cool structured data for input. So there's a limit to what we can build out in terms of uh, viewers and the output, but it's definitely of interest. Right now, we're still focusing on improving the general quality of the parsing and getting the WYSIWYG hooked in, time for OJS3. But that, that is an area we're interested in. Great, thanks. Well, thank you. Well, any other questions for Alex?
Well, I hope you'll all join me in thanking Alex for his time today.